Okay, just want to welcome everybody online, on, in person, and just uh, very have uh, very much anticipation about what the Lord is going to do. I, I just, Angie, she's not in here, so I can say this. Uh, she prayed, and I'm, I, she, every time I say it, I always misquote her, but she'll like, I, I know I said this, but she prayed something like this. She's like praying for our message, and she was like, Lord, I just pray that up until the very moment Brian speaks, you would be continuing to give him stuff. I'm like, oh, that means like it's totally, I, I mean, I have no idea what I'm even going to say. And so anyway, the Lord has fulfilled that, so I'm just like, I've got so many different thoughts and everything, so I'm, I just... I'm going to trust God to bring it together into one puzzle here so we can really get a sense of what the Lord is speaking. And the, the title of this message is An Invitation to Readiness. And as we were worshiping, the, just the Lord put on my heart, the Lord put on my heart just, you know, thinking about back all the way back into 1996. Try to think about what you were doing in 1996. A lot of you were probably like, yeah, I wasn't even a thought in my parents' mind in 1996. But 1996, I just remember 1997, that time frame is we, we went, or mom and dad went to Mike Bickle's Forerunner. It was, a, it was a Passion for Jesus conference in 1997. And he spoke about the Forerunner spirit. And I've never heard a message like that in my life. And I still have never heard a message quite like that in my life. It was life-changing. And the, just the thought I had was when we were worshiping was that message was an on-ramp to readiness for us. And, I, and, and so I thought about that. What would have happened if mom and dad and me and, me and Angie, I didn't even know Angie existed in 1997. So... What would have happened if mom and dad and me, Randall and Sharice, what would have happened if we would not have taken that on-ramp God gave us when we heard that message in 1997 to get on that ramp towards readiness? We didn't have a clue what being ready was about. All we knew was like God was saying, we must get ready. And I look back at that and I think, where would we be right now if we didn't say yes back then? And then I was thinking, this morning I was thinking, okay, think back if you've been with us for a few years or more than a few years, think back to 2017, the word of the Lord comes to us. And if you weren't here, I'm just going to share, just to help you understand where I'm coming from. But the word of the Lord comes to us and it was basically, I'm going to summarize it, but it was basically like, the train of my presence is moving, and only those who are ready are going to be on board. And it was a call to get ready. And if you don't get ready, you will not be taken to your destination or your destiny. And the Lord, the Lord called us, and he said, you need to go into two years of intense training. Remember that? Two years of intense training. And we did that. And a lot of us responded with seriousness and we, we did that. We, we did everything we knew to do. But I want, to think of, I want you to think about this. What would have happened if Elijah had come back in 2017? And Elijah was standing here, and Elijah said, you've got three years to get ready. Because in three years, a virus is going to break out of China. And this virus is going to spread throughout the entire world. And this virus is going to lock down entire cities, nations, states are going to be under lockdown. It's going to shut down every single thing about life, restaurants, sporting events, you know, uh, TV, media, whatever. It's going to shut down every single thing you know about. And what's going to happen is Western governments that have been democratic are going to begin to shift more into socialistic, even communist type governments. What they're going to do is they're going to try to force upon you a vaccine that if you don't take this vaccine, you can lose your job. This, you know, think about that. And think about if Elijah would have said, you're going to see riots. You're going to see civil unrest. You're going to see sky, skyrocketing inflation come. Think about if Elijah would have said that. And he said, you have three years to get ready. Raise your hand if you think you would have taken that a little bit more serious than we did. I know I would have. I know I would have. I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, okay, 
Man, if we would have known, I mean, how kind was the Lord to come to us back then, not knowing anything that was going to take place, and with such an urgency to speak to us prophetically, get ready. You have two years to get ready. I mean, how kind was that, knowing now what the times were going to be in 2020 and, now, and even into 2022, how kind of the Lord to come to us with an urgent call to us in a prophetic anointing and say, you need to get ready. That was the kindness of the Lord. That was the kindness of the Lord. And it needed to jolt us out of sleep, didn't it? It needed, he needed to wake us out of slumber, didn't he? Now, I want you to think about this. Here's what I want to, I want to share. Here's what I want to do and what I, what I want to say is when I was praying yesterday about this message, I had it all mapped out what I wanted to say, but the Lord just came and spoke to me, gave me this, this word. I want to share this. Is he said, if you could have known then what you now know, most would have taken it more serious than they did. They're talking about the two years of training. Don't you see the wisdom in that prophetic call? Some took it serious, others didn't. But in my kindness, I offer another invitation to get back on the path to being made ready. And I believe the Lord's offering that to us once again. The path to being made ready. And I would say this invitation is for us at Restoration Life. It's for us in the Forerunner School. It's for those who listen to us online. It's really for the body of Christ just, we're just sharing this here, is there is now another on-ramp to readiness. Right now, I believe the Lord is speaking that to us right now. There is now another on-ramp to readiness. We're entering into another season where the Lord's like, there is an on-ramp to readiness. And because I am good, I push delete on bad responses from the past. So, even if you feel like, okay, you know, I didn't really take it serious like I should have. If I would have known what was going to happen, then what I know now, I would have done things different. And the Lord's like, okay, don't dwell on the past. I'm pushing delete on, your, on a bad response. But, I, but here's what I believe the Lord is now saying. I will give grace. I will give grace in this new invitation. God wants to give grace to us. Grace is the power of God to be who he's called you to be. It's the power of God to do what he's called you to do. It's not dependent on your own merit, your own works, your own abilities or inabilities, your gifts or your talents. Grace is the supernatural power of God that God will give to us to make ourselves ready. God gives a greater grace. And I believe we're moving right now into a time and a season where the Lord is, is now saying, I am going to give you greater grace to make yourself ready. He is going to accelerate this work. I will give grace in this new invitation to accelerate readiness to, to all who wholeheartedly respond to the prophetic invitation. Amen. That's what I want to do in this message, is I want to say God is inviting us to be ready. And, you know, I know some people, if you've been with us a long time, you're like, God, I've, every time he's done this or dad's done this or whoever's done this, I've said yes, I've said yes. How many more times until I'm really ready? So did I just read your mind? God's answer, I think, would be until you're ready. It's real simple. It's not about, God works in layers and layers and layers and layers. It's like the layers of peeling an onion back to get at that place of readiness. God's goal is not what you do to get ready or how you respond. God's goal is, are you ready? It's not about, am I willing? It's, am I ready? God wants to make us ready. God wants to give us that grace. And so what I want to do in this message is I want to, I want to try my best to paint a clear picture of where we are in the world, 
where we are likely heading or could be heading. And my goal in this is to set the context for the times we're living in because what I really want to do today is offer this prophetic invitation to really make ourselves ready. It's kind of like this is a wake-up call. I want to set the context for what's going on to issue a wake-up call to the body of Christ that God is now offering another invitation to make yourself ready, and there's grace that will accompany that invitation. And I've been doing this long enough to know with, with a sad heart how easy it is when people don't fully respond the way God wants them to respond and don't receive the grace to, to go in and enter into this. And the thing is, you never, ever know you missed it, ever. That's the power of deception. And so my heart is that we would be able to hear the Lord's wake-up call, the Lord blowing a trumpet in Zion to this on-ramp of readiness. Now, you can just look at the world right now. I mean, wouldn't you say we're in a mess? I mean, we are in an absolute mess right now. I mean, from the threat of skyrocketing inflation to the U.S. dollar potentially not being the world's reserve currency, which would disrupt everything we've known in the Western world, to the war in Ukraine and where that could potentially lead, possibly to a a World War III. We don't know. I mean, we're living in such shakable times to inflation, to what I've been talking about, the great reset of the global elite wanting to bring in an entirely new financial system. I mean, we are living in such shakable times, and the Lord wants us to really, to really get our attention. Wake up. Wake up. We cannot go back to sleep. We, got to get, we must get ready. Amen. See, God wants his church to overcome and even thrive during challenging times. The Lord, I'm quoting Romans 5.17 that we are called to reign in life by the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. We are not meant in this time, even though things around us are shaking, we are not meant to just go into a corner and wait for Jesus to come back. We are meant to be the, the light that shines in a crooked generation. We are meant to be the salt that preserves the culture who's rapidly going into decay. We are meant to be a prophetic voice of the truth that says this is the word of the Lord to a, to a people who've gone mad. We are meant to shine in this time and not retreat. We're meant to be overcomers and we're meant to reign in life. God has not called us to shrink back in fear. God has not called us to be a coward. God has said, like he said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. That's what he's saying to us. Be strong and be courageous. Okay, hear this, hear this. Be courageous. We cannot be a coward in this time. We've got to respond with faith. We've got to respond with a boldness. We've got to be people like Bonhoeffer who will rise up. You know, Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who resisted Hitler. In this time we live in, the church of Jesus Christ needs to be an army of Bonhoeffers who says we will not bow to the Antichrist system that's rising up. We will be bold. We will be courageous. We will not shrink back in fear. We will not cower in the corner waiting for Jesus to come back. We will be like Bonhoeffer. We will be a prophetic voice that will resist the spirit of Antichrist. Amen. God wants us to be overcomers. God wants us to reign in life. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. He's given us everything we need to have victory. He has our, see, our victory comes not for victory, but from from victory. Our victory comes from the victory of Jesus Christ that he won on the cross and the victory he's won in your human spirit. You fight from victory, not for victory, but God wants us to walk as overcomers who are conquering and more than conquerors in this time. See, I'm going to talk today 
about the need to overcome and even thrive in this challenging time. We must be prepared spiritually, mentally, physically, and even materially for the times we're living in. See, when it comes to difficult times, my philosophy, this is, I believe this is a really good philosophy to have, is we want to hope for the best and we want to prepare for the worst. We want to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. So if I talk about negative things that are happening, it's not to discourage you. It's not to make you afraid. It's not to make you depressed, okay? Just know that, all right? I love the current American life. In fact, yesterday I was thinking, I, 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 for the first time I was able to cook on the Traeger grill that you all gave us for my birthday, and it was just an incredible day. It was just spring day, 65 degrees, looking out the backyard, the creek flowing, just just you know, getting the Traeger, I was like, this is awesome. I was like, God, I really hope all the stuff I'm going to talk about tomorrow doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm hoping for the best. I love my American lifestyle. I love good food. I love great coffee. I, I mean, you know, I'm saying, I love the way it is, but I'm hoping for the best. I'm hoping everything I'm going to say, I hope we can look back and say, okay, what you're talking about, Brian, never happened. I'm like, good. I'm really glad that didn't happen. I'm hoping for the best. But we also need to prepare for the worst. I don't know why we can't do both. I don't know why we have this, a lot of the body of Christ can't handle this tension between hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. And we, we, we just want to just say, okay, I don't even want to hear this stuff because it's too negative and it makes me feel afraid or it makes me feel depressed. No, we're hearing this because we need to prepare for what's coming. We live in a different hour. We don't live in 2019. We live in a very different time. We need to wake up to know that. Amen. See, this message is an invitation to make yourself ready. It's an on-ramp for readiness. Readiness for the Lord, readiness for the times we live in, and readiness for the times that are going to be unfolding even in the days ahead. This message, it will help you thrive during challenging times and difficult times by offering 10 ways to help you get ready. So I'm going to talk about that today in this message is about, is about 10 things that are, are happening. Now, I'm going to lay a little bit of background before I get into that. So I want you to turn in the scriptures to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. And I believe it's a, it's a pertinent verse for us because once you understand this scripture, you realize, okay, this is, this is actually happening right now. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul's writing, and he says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. I want to say this, that this verse has probably not been preached very often in the American church in the last 10, 15 years. We've gotten so comfortable in our Western world comfort, luxurious lifestyle, which I love, and I hope it doesn't change, but we've gotten so comfortable that pastors, teachers, voices, messengers, shepherds are not speaking these things because it will make people not feel good and they won't come back. But realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. Why are they going to come? Is it because God's mean? Is it because God's angry? Is it because God's in a bad mood? No. It's because Men will be lovers of themselves and women. Men and women will be lovers of themselves. And we could just stop right there. Everything we're seeing go on right now in this world is because men are lovers of themselves and women are lovers of themselves. We become infatuated with the self-life, the self-love. It's all about me and what I can get out of it and what I'm going to do and what's the benefit of, of it in it for me. It's all about me. Now, notice the second, the second phrase Paul uses. He says, men will be lovers of money. Everything that has happened in America and the Western world over the past two years comes down to these two verses. Men are lovers of themselves and they're lovers of money. Money is, money is, the love of money is the root 
of all evil. If you want to understand what is going on, it's really as simple as knowing the love of money is the root of all evil. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean like evil or money is evil. I mean, if, if, if some people have gotten to this other extreme to say money is evil. No, it's not money that's evil. We need money, and it's better to have more money than less money. The, but the, the problem is, is when we love money, when money drives us, and it, it just all that's going on in the world can come down to men are lovers of money. And so I'm not going to read this entire scripture, but simply put, human depravity is what is at the root of everything that's taking place. And the church today, we've lost that sense of the, what the scriptures teach about human depravity, the fallen man and woman, the fallen humanity. We've lost that, that sense of depravity of the sinful, of the sinful heart of man, that, that the, the heart is desperately sick and wicked, and who can comprehend it? We've lost that. And now we say, well, they need therapy or they need counseling. And I'm not saying you don't need that stuff, but I'm saying that... that that at the heart of it all is the depravity of man. We need Jesus Christ. We need Jesus Christ and we need the indwelling Holy Spirit to change our hearts and to change us inwardly in a supernatural work that only God can do. So what I want to do in this message is, is I want to try my best to strike this delicate balance between explaining what is really taking place to wake you up while not saying so much that you leave church discouraged and afraid. Okay, how, do you, how many of you know that's a challenge, okay? That's really the goal I want to do. I don't want you to leave church going like, oh God, depressed and afraid. If you, if you think about too much of this stuff, you will get that way. That's not my goal. My goal is to say just enough to say, okay, I really, really, really need to wake up and get ready. But I don't want to say so much that you go like, ugh, you know, just leave depressed and discouraged. So I'm relying on the grace of Jesus to help me with that because it's not easy to say, to, to hit that goal. It's not easy. It's not easy. So I'm, God, help me. Help me. I want you way more focused on what you need to do to prepare for what's coming and, what, and the Lord himself, which is the most important, rather than on the negative. But I also need to explain some things to you. I also need to um, just real quick explain what is really happening and where this could possibly go. Because remember this, understanding is what fuels readiness. Understanding fuels readiness. When you understand the hour we live in, and when you understand the times we live in, and you understand where this could be headed, that understanding empowers you to make yourself ready. That's why the book of Revelation is all, you know, that has the unfolding of what we would say are negative events. That's why the greatest call to make yourself ready is found in the book of Revelation because understanding of the times you live in, understanding of where things are going is the fuel we need to make ourselves ready. It motivates us to make ourselves ready. That's why we're doing this. It's not, to, I, I promise you, I promise you, I hope what I'm saying doesn't happen, all right? I hope what I'm saying doesn't take place, but... My goal in this is to say it so that we will get on this on-ramp to readiness. Amen. Okay, the other thing I want to say is I want to, I want to show a slide here. And so, Quentin, you can get this thing set up here. Give me one second. I want to assure you, <laughs> we've cut, you know, since the beginning of, of the year between dad and myself, the Lord has given us a series of prophetic messages that have really, uh, really, the Lord's really moved us to focus on current events, the end times, and stuff like that. I want to say this, we're not going to be focused on the end times. This will be the last message focused on the end times or current events for a while, okay? So praise God, it'll be, it will definitely be more encouraging, more inspirational. Dad's going to be talking about the bride of Christ. I'm going to be talking about indwelling life. 
So I just, so all I'm going to say is, okay, this will be the last message we focus on. So you can pay attention for this, this part, and then we'll move into what we would be considered better news. Okay, so can you see the slide? Yep, yep. Okay, so an invitation to readiness is, is actually, I made this font so small, I can't read it. Okay, so the context is for the last eight, I don't know, since January, we've been focused on getting a prophetic perspective of 2020 through 2022 and even into 2030. And the goal of this is to say, okay, these things are happening, therefore, wake up. Therefore, wake up. Now, this is leading us into what God's calling us into, which is the bride. Dad's going to spend about five weeks talking about the bride of Christ and his new class that he's done. And the, the goal of that class is to say, get ready. And then I'm going to talk about for about four or five months, um, and it, it's going to be, I mean, I've been writing this stuff, and it's been so life-changing, so encouraging. I'm going to be talking about indwelling life, which is the commission. It's, it's how to get ready. So, Dad, you know, we basically we're setting the context of the need to wake up and get ready. And then Dad is going to be talking about the vision that the bride makes herself ready. And then I'm going to be talking about how to actually do it. And as I've been reading, as again, I've been reading this book, it is so incredibly encouraging. It's life-changing. You don't want to miss that. It's, you don't want to miss Dad's teaching either. They're both going to be life-changing. So anyway, I said all that to say, I know people are like, well, he, all he ever talks about is the end times and all he ever talks is about the negative things or whatever. Okay, we're not going to be talking about that for the next probably six months. Okay, so pay attention. I want to encourage you so I don't have to say it again. Amen. Okay, so what is happening right now is I want to talk about eight different things that, are, that is happening right now to give us understanding about what is taking place. Is The first thing I think we have to understand is that the Lord is judging America. Well, how do you know God is judging America? Well, I know Isaiah chapter 3 talks about when God judges a nation, he puts leaders, incompetent leaders, into positions of power to lead nations. <laughs> How many of you have heard Kamala Harris explain the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis and want to know, if you haven't, you can Google it, but basically she said something like, Russia's a big country, Ukraine's a smaller country. Ru I mean, I'm not going to rehearse what she said, but I, l I listened to that and said, okay, you cannot tell me we're not under God's judgment when we have leadership like that. Okay, we have Joe Biden, who has basically lost his mind. He's got dementia. And God put him there, okay? It's just, it's just it's what it is. The America, God, the Lord is judging America. I don't think it's rocket science. I don't think it's rocket science to realize God is judging America. It's really, really simple. Now, I want to just bring you back to this prophetic word I gave back in, I think it was September of 2020 before the election that I think will clarify where we are right now. This was before the election. America, this is the Lord, the word the Lord gave me. America, the great eagle. And it was referencing uh, um, Daniel chapter 7. I am plucking out your wings one by one until your nakedness is exposed to all. I will pluck out your wings one by one until all the world sees your shame and nakedness. Now, isn't that being fulfilled right now? Like Nebuchadnezzar, you will be like a mad animal for seven years. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be seven years. It could be. I don't know how long it's going to be. And then I will restore you. Now, you know the story of Nebuchadnezzar when he went mad. His, he, he, he lost his mind. He lost his mind and went mad in, the, in, the, the, in Babylon, hanging out in the, the grass and the dew just like an animal. He lost his mind. That was before the election. I look back at that and I'm like, man, if I would have known that, maybe I would have had a little more different perspective. But, it, you know, I'm not going to dwell on that. My point is to say that the Lord has, the, the America is presently under judgment. Okay? That's not something I like to say. I'm sure that's not something you like to hear. 
But if you really think about it and you read scripture, it's very, very clear America is under judgment. So we got to understand America is the Lord is judging America. Now, the Lord's heart in judging America, I don't believe, is to destroy America. I believe God's heart for America goes back to his original intention in the founding of this country is to bring us into our finest hour, our, our destiny. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be the world's superpower. I believe that status is now going away. I want it to go away because we'll never fulfill what God has for our nation if we are the world's superpower because all the pride and all the arrogance has led us to where we are, all right? So I do believe God's intention in the, his judgment is redemptive. It's to be, bring restoration. It's not to bring this, a destruction of the nation of America, all right? So we got to know that. We got to know God is judging America. And if, it's one of the things the Lord spoke to me. He said, Brian, you cannot pray this one away. You cannot pray this one away. You know, and I know we all love God have mercy, God have mercy. And I don't feel, feel like the Lord is saying to us that we can pray this judgment away. God has decreed it. God has done it. God has put into the office the two he has put into office. I mean, you look at the leadership of this administration, it is absolutely an embarrassment. It's sad. It, it just, it's just almost laughable if it wasn't so serious. And, you're, and there's nothing you can do. I believe it's, an, it's something the Lord himself has done. He's judging America. But it's, it's, to be, it's to bring redemption. God's heart in this is to bring redemption. Second thing we need to know is the global economy is broken. The global economy is broken. The U.S. right now is in $30 trillion of debt. $30 trillion in debt. The, I think we need to understand the 2008 economic crash. They never, ever fixed that, that economic crash. And that economic crash is now leading to the Great Reset. And I've talked about the Great Reset, and I've talked about all the, that they're planning to do and want to do. I've, you know, I did two messages on it, wrote about it. But this is, and you can look on our website to our YouTube channel to get more information. But they never, they never fixed the 2008 economic crisis. So it's leading to what they are pushing for in the Great Reset. They are dead set on having a Great Reset, okay? Globalists around the world, this is not conspiracy theory. You can go research it yourself. Globalists around the world are pushing for a Great Reset. Our, many of our leaders in, our, in the highest levels of government are pushing for this great reset, okay? It's a, it's a fundamental change of the economy. From 2008, to, I mentioned that, is we've used band-aids to try to fix the economy. Number three, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is about a new world order. Now, we don't know where this is headed. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you where this, this is headed. I mean, I hope it ends tomorrow. I really do. But when I look at this... I look at it and I say, this is potentially the making of a new world order. And if you, if you think about this, some people want to know, why is Putin invading Russia? Well, everything's complicated, but I'm just going to give you one angle just real quick. You probably, I don't know if you can even read that, but I certainly can't read it on my phone. I'm going to summarize it. But there was a, a couple weeks ago, probably right around the beginning of the war, Putin said that, that Russia is still part of the global economy. And people cannot put Russia out of the global economy. And so basically, part of the timing of this reason for this invasion is because this great reset was rising up and Russia was not a key player in this great reset. And so there's a, there's a lot more factors in that. I'm not going to go into every factor. But I believe that's part of this reason. This, this is Russia saying this, that Russia knows the World Economic Forum's plans and strategies, and Russia says we are, we are still part of the global economy. You can't leave Russia out. I, I believe that's kind of what his motivation is. But the, the goal here, I believe what, what could potentially happen, all right, so I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm saying what could potentially happen, where this could potentially lead, is to this place of national imperialism where Russia and China, who want to have nationalism, who want to have, whether it's communism or, yeah, both would be communism, national communism versus global fascism. Because Europe, America, Canada is really moving to this global fascism. Fascism is basically the merging together of government and big corporations. 
And, and you're beginning to see this. I mean, that, that's why all these, all these government agendas are being united with corporations and corporations are going woke. And they're all, you know, I've talked about that a couple weeks ago. But you're seeing this world order beginning to merge between national communism versus international uh, or, or global fascism. That's kind of to understand the big picture of where things are headed. And the whole the whole thing, to, to really make it simple, is which world order and economic system is going to dominate. I believe that's where we're at. I believe America's days of being the world superpower and the world reserve currency, I believe those days are over. I hope, that, I hope I'm not wrong. I hope I'm, not, I hope I'm wrong about that. Number four, neither new world order wants the U.S. dollar to be the king. Even... Even many in our government. A couple, of, I don't know, I don't know, a year and a half ago, the Lord started speaking to me that there are people in your government that are intentionally trying to destroy the U.S. dollar. And I, I didn't know how, I mean, I kind of just realized, okay, that makes sense. But now we're into 2022 and all that they've done, the, the crazy decisions we're making of being de dependent on foreign oil and all that that's involved in that, and you're like, that makes zero sense. The only way that could make sense if they are intentionally trying to weaken the dollar to bring in the Great Reset. They're, they're, I believe they are intentionally trying to bring down the U.S. dollar. Uh, the U.S. dollar, see, a lot of us go, well, what's, what relevance does that have to me? And I want to say everything about your life is because the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency. If that U.S. dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency, our lifestyles are going to change dramatically. I'm not trying to put fear into you. I'm just saying we got to prepare for what could hopefully take place. I don't want it to take place. I don't want it to take place, but we got to be ready for what could potentially take place. Since World War II, America has been the world's reserve currency. In 1971, the U.S., you, you may know this, you may not, but in 1971, the U.S. ended their dependence on foreign gold. So every before 1971, the dollar was always backed by gold. So every dollar we had was backed by gold. But because they had gotten so far into debt and because they wanted to spend more money for their plans, they shifted to where the dollar is no longer backed by gold. And they made a deal with oil, oil nations like Saudi Arabia to say, okay, you provide the oil and you make sure every single dollar is going to be, every single transaction is going to be in dollars, and we will back up whatever, whoever doesn't comply with that with our military might. And that became what people call the petrodollar. So now the, the, the reason the economy has been so powerful is because the U.S. dollar is the petrodollar supported by oil. So how many came to church to learn about uh, social studies? And uh, anyway, but it's important to understand these things. So I, I mentioned that, but let's go a little bit faster. But just in, this happened, I think, last week or the week before, Saudi Arabia is now considering taking the Chinese dollar rather than the American dollar in exchange for oil. That's a big deal. Now, hopefully that does not happen. That's a big deal. If that begins to happen, the U.S. dollar begins to weaken substantially. So, again... Uh, even our, even our, the Fed Reserve, Powell, said that it's possible to have more than one reserve currency. This is, the, this is where this is moving. This is where this is moving. I'm, I'm not going to go into all this because I want to move on to other things. But, and I, I mentioned the, the, uh, the Great Reset. is just to, And I have mentioned the Great Reset in the past few sermons. But I want to say this. Is, and I mentioned the ESG, the, the Environmental, Social Justice, and Governance Credit Score that will determine whether you can get loans. It's going to change everything if this, this really gets embedded. Is, this, is the global leaders are very wise and crafty. They have, they have designed a way through this ESG credit system to be a backdoor around constitutional governments. They're getting in around the backdoor through this ESG credit system. And this ESG credit system is like a Trojan horse allowing globalists, globalists to conquer nations from within. The Great Reset wants a green economy, that we want to move everything to, we want to move everything off of oil to electric cars. Now, I know, again, you're like, where is this going? This is boring. And I hear Anna, she was here. This is so boring. Okay, this is really, really, really important. 
because this means life as we know it in America could change drastically in one moment. Okay, again, I hope it doesn't, but it could happen. And I don't think this is like, this is not, I mean, this is where it's going unless God intervenes. This is where it's headed unless God intervenes. All these factors could greatly weaken the U.S. economy. This could lead to skyrocketing inflation. I mean, if the U.S. dollar is no longer the world's reserve currency, the inflation we know now is nothing. All right? That this could lead to uh, food shortages, supply chain disruptions. My goal is to say, I would rather be prepared and be wrong. I would rather hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Part of my heart is to say this is like, listen, we're headed into uncharted territory. And as a pastor, I, I just don't want, I want you to be prepared for what's coming. I've got to share, I've got to share what could potentially happen. So you prepare. I'm not trying to make you ruin your day. Number seven, this one's a big one, is central bank digital currency is coming. So the Federal Reserve is a central bank. The Bank of London is a central bank. The, even, I think, last week or the week before, Biden ex signed an executive order. I don't know if you know this or not, but Biden signed an executive order saying we need to start doing the research into central bank digital currencies. Now, when he says do the research, they've been already researching this for years. They were basically saying we need to, that was basically political speak to say we need to get this implemented. Now, central bank digital currency is, I'm not going to go into that, but central bank digital currency will give the government the ability to spend, to control where you spend your money, how you spend your money, and how much money you spend. It will, it will mean absolute total control by the government. That's where, they, that's where they are moving towards unless God intervenes. And I'll say this, central bank digital currency is not the mark of the beast, but it is a forerunner for it. All right? So that's the times we live in, okay? So I'm going to move on to something more positive now. So I want you to know that's, that is the times we live in. Now, what should our response be? Should we dwell on this? Should we think about this? Should we, you know, I would encourage you not to think much about this because you'll really get depressed, okay? We want to focus on the Lord. That's why on our worship today was so focused on God is in control. Though the storms rage, though the, though the nations are totter, though the nations are enraged, God is in control. And so I was thinking about this is I, I, came, I decided to come up with a, a new version of Psalm 46, a modern-day version of Psalm 46. In fact, that song we were singing, God is in Control, is from Psalm 46. And so I want to read this to you to give you encouragement to know, okay, this we were born for this moment. We're not to shrink back into fear, and we're not to get nervous or discouraged. God is our refuge. Psalm 46, I'm going to read the modern-day version of it. Is God is our refuge and strength. God is our very present help in trouble. God is your help. The Lord is your help. Therefore, you shall not fear. Even if the U.S. dollar weakens and the Great Reset changes the financial system as we know it. Even if our economy is shaken and supply chain disruptions hit us and we experience food shortages... Even if global fascism is established, God is in control. In the midst of shaking, verse 4 and 5, in the midst of shaking, the corporate gathering is of utmost importance. The corporate gathering is so important right now. As we worship together, the river of God's spirit flows, making us glad and filling us with the Lord's joy. Together we are a living temple of living stones, a dwelling place of the Most High God. God is in our midst. Okay, I want you to get that. God is in our midst. God is among us, and we will not be moved. God is with us. Okay, get that. If you don't get anything else, God is with us. God is with us. God is with you. God is with you. 
Do not fear. God is with you. Since God is with you, we will not be moved, disturbed, or shaken. God is for us and will help us during the best of times and the worst of times. Verse 6, Russia invaded Ukraine, perhaps leading to a world war or a new world order. Even so, listen to this, if and when the Lord chooses, he can simply raise his voice and melt every human plan in an instant. God is the one who causes wars to cease. God is the one who breaks the bow and breaks the spear. He burns chariots. He burns tanks. God is in control, all right? The Lord is in control. If the Lord wants this to end, he will end it by his voice. We don't have to be afraid. God is in control. He can move it in an instant. He is the all-powerful, sovereign God. Verse 7, you think Russia and China have powerful, powerful armies? Have you seen the Lord's invisible armies of angels and chariots? Like Elisha told his servant, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Our God is the all-powerful Lord of heaven's armies and he is with us. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ is our stronghold. God is the Lord of heaven's armies. And there are way more armies of angels and chariots that we can't see than there are tanks and missiles of the enemy. Verse 8 through 9. Come behold the works of the Lord. He has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He destroys planes and ballistic missiles, nuclear bombs, armies. He burns tanks with fire. Verse 10, this is what we really need to get here is in verse 10. Cease striving, be still, let go and relax, and know he is God. He is God. He will be exalted in the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. Cease striving and know that he is God. Verse 11, the Lord of heaven's armies is with us. Just think about that for a second. The Lord of heaven's armies is with us, with the remnant. God is with the remnant of his people. They might have all these other things. We have the Lord of heaven's armies, and he is with us. Therefore, we are not moved or afraid. Amen. God is our stronghold. God is our refuge. So how do we respond? How do we respond to the shaking that we are presently in? Well, we don't put our head in the sand and we don't try to ignore it. We don't become afraid or worried or anxious. How do we respond? What do we need to do? What is it that we need to do? Is I've listed a few things here. Is number one, we've got to know that you were born for such a time as this. You were born for this moment. You were born for this very moment. God formed you in the womb for this very moment and hour. You were destined to live in 2022. Whatever age you're at, you were destined for this time and moment. This is the church's finest hour. I'm not promising you it's going to be fun. And I'm not going to promise you it's going to be easy. I'm not promising you it's not going to be challenging. But I am saying the Lord's finest hour has now come to the church and now the Lord wants us to be strong and courageous and to realize we were born and prepared for this very hour and for this very moment. Therefore, we will rise up in faith. We will not back down in fear and be cowards and say, I'm going to run into the corner and, and be you know, all worried and anxious. I'm going to rise up in faith and I'm going to seize the destiny God has made me for. Second thing, I kind of hit on this already, but don't shrink back in fear. Seize the moment. Hebrews talks about, Hebrews chapter 10 talks about we are not those who shrink back to destruction. 
If you shrink back into, if you shrink back, listen, if you shrink back in fear rather than seize the moment, it will lead to your destruction. Jesus said, he who tries to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. If you want to save your life and sh by shrinking back into this time we live in and shrinking back in fear, you'll lose your life. Seize the moment. Seize the moment. Number three, trust God and don't be afraid. This is really the times we live in are going to test us. Do we trust God? Do we trust God? He's in sovereign control over the nations. The Lord measures the span of the universe. The, or the Lord measures the universe in the span of his hand. He has the waters of the earth in his palm. He knows every star by name. He looks down and merely breathes on something and it melts. God is in sovereign control. You can trust God to take care of you. You can trust God to take care of your family. You can trust God to give you the strength you need in the hour we live in. You can trust God. You can trust him and you don't have to be afraid or nervous or anxious. Number four, set your mind on the Lord and experience peace. I'm sure in this decade of decades we live in, 2020, I'm sure all of us will be tempted at times to experience anxiety. Don't, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> We're all, go, all of us, myself included. In fact, I should probably go back and listen to this message next week when I'm tested, you know, because I'm tested on everything I preach. Is if God is calling us to set our minds on him, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace. Think about that right now. Think about the testimony the church of Jesus Christ can be to this world who's spinning out of control with anxiety that God says, if you will set your mind on me, set your mind, set your thinking, set your meditation, set your thoughts on the Lord, on me, God promises you, I will give you perfect peace. What an incredible promise he gives us. Number five, dwell in God's presence to experience his safety and protection. Psalms 91. Did you realize Psalms 91 is a conditional promise? It is not a promise for every single believer. That promise is it, the, the one who dwells, basically this, if you will make the Lord your refuge, if you will dwell in the Lord's presence, if you will have a secret place relationship with Jesus Christ, God will protect you. But if you don't, it doesn't mean he won't, but it doesn't mean he will. <laughs> but if you make the Lord your dwelling place, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you seek the Lord's presence, he promises you he will protect you from pestilence. He will protect you from uh, missiles and war. He will be your protection. He will give his angels charge concerning you so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. God is your refuge. God is your strength. God is your dwelling place. If you will make him the, the, an integral part of your life as your lifestyle, if he becomes your life, he will protect you. You will not Go until it's the Lord's time for you to go. Number six is we must trust God to be our provider. Now, it's one thing to trust God to be our provider when the American economy is the world's leading economy and we're every single, you know, prosperity in our nation that we know. It's one thing to trust God in that situation, now, in the times we're moving into, we might have to trust God as our provider on a whole new level. I mean, I've never had to trust the Lord like that. I don't know what it's going to be like. You haven't had to trust the Lord quite like that. We, and again, we don't know 
what's going to happen. We don't know where this is going. I just, wanted, I just want us to know the Lord is your provider. The Lord is your provider. You are in a covenant with God. He is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. He will provide for every one of your needs. He will provide for your needs. Whatever, whatever you're going through, God is your provider. God is your provider. And the Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount, don't worry. Don't take a thought about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, you know, where you're going to live. Don't take a thought about any of that. God himself is your provider. Seek first the kingdom of God or what we might say in context to where the Lord's leading us right now, pursue readiness as a bride and all these other things will be added back to you. If you make the Lord your passion, if you make the Lord your pursuit, if you run hard after the Lord, he promises to take care of every one of your needs. God will take care of you. Just know that, okay? Just know that. Get it deep in your heart. The Lord will take care of you. Number seven, and I mentioned this last Sunday, draw from the well of salvation. Draw from the well of salvation. Isaiah chapter 12, draw from the well of salvation. The Lord has to become our source. If we are relying on the external for peace, on the external for joy, on the external for life, we are going to be sorely disappointed. It should have always been that way, but America has been incredibly blessed and it's been so easy to derive our joy from externals. Now that's, that has to change. It's the gospel. It should have changed anyway, but the gospel is derive your joy not from your own self, but from Christ who now dwells inside of you. You have a well of salvation inside of you. You have joy and peace and love and patience and faith and meekness. You have strength and self-control. You have that in you, not because of you, but because of Christ who dwells in you. Draw from that well of salvation so that Christ himself is your joy. Christ himself is your peace. Not that he just gives you peace. Not that he just gives you joy. He is your joy. And he is your peace. See, if he gives you peace and he gives you joy, you can still live your own life. But Christ wants to be your life. He wants to become in you your joy, your peace, his life living in you, his strength empowering you. If the very spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you, you can do everything. You can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives you inward strength. You've got everything you need. Listen, You've got everything you need to live in 2022 and the decade of the 2020s. You've got everything, if you're born again, if you're born again, you have everything you need to live victorious in this decade because you have Christ. You have everything you need for life and godliness. You have everything you need to overcome. You have everything you need to reign in this life. You have everything you need not to be afraid. You have everything you need to live in joy and not discouragement because Christ dwells in you. Learn to draw from this well of salvation so that what is in you is now released outward from your spirit into your heart and your soul and your body. Number nine, number eight, it, I've, I've hit on this quite a bit, but you are more than a conqueror and you can reign in life no matter the circumstances. You can reign in life no matter the circumstances. I already hit on that, so I won't spend any more time on that one. Number nine, and this is kind of the, the thrust of this message, is we need to get ready spiritually, mentally, physically and materially for the hour we live in. And so we're going to spend, we're going to spend six months or longer focused between dad's class and my class of how to get ready spiritually. So I'm not going to talk about that. We're going to, that's going to be our focus for 
the next six months or so, probably even longer, probably even be longer than that, nine months of, of, of getting ready. But we need to prepare mentally. We need to prepare mentally, not, not getting into fear. You know, we can actually do two things at one time. We can prepare mentally for what could happen without getting into fear. We can say, okay, if this happens, I need to be able to respond this way. If this happens, I need to be able to do this. If this happens, I need to be able to do that. We need to respond materially. We, I think we even need to respond physically. I would recommend everybody, if you can, is, is you know, it's always important to be physically fit to whatever that means for you. Be healthy, you know, eat well, exercise, whatever that means for you. And then finally, I would say, we, it, I, it, we need to prepare materially. You know, Noah got ready, not by going off and spending quiet times with Jesus. Noah got ready for what was coming by doing something materially. He built an ark. And it took him time to build an ark. Now, what I'm talking about is, and I'm sure, just to be honest with you, I have, I've been hearing messages kind of like this for a while, and I've never, ever once felt the need to prep to get materially prepared for what's coming ever. Y2K, I lived through Y2K. That was just a joke. I lived through 9 <laughs> I love what dad said about Y2K. He went to Fiji. I think he was in Fiji during Y2K, this, the remote island in Fiji. And he's like, they, didn't, they weren't the least bit concerned about Y2K. I mean, they only had like one power generator on the island. And, you know, it's like it, Y2K came and you're like, you know, and so I think it's kind of conditioned us to say, okay, the boy who cried wolf, yeah, you're really saying this time's going to be it. We lived through 9-11. We lived through the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. I've never, ever felt, to be honest, the need to physically or to materially get prepped with, with uh, food and stuff like that. But I do feel that way now. I really do. Now, you pray about it. You can actually get prepared physically, materially, without getting weird. I know... Just the other day, um, <laughs> I'm sure we've all seen the weirdos, and maybe you're one of those, but hopefully you're not. But the other day, me and Angie started really feeling the need to store, get some emergency food. And so they have some at Costco. And so anyway, we walked in and we got three kits of, uh, of those things. And you're kind of like, okay, God, help no one to see me. And you're sitting there, you pull your hat down real low. I almost wore a mask to cover my whole face, but I didn't. But I walk in there, and then this one lady checks me out. She's like, you think something bad's going to happen? And I'm like, uh, well, you know, you never know. I mean, it doesn't look great right now, but I'm just getting ready. She's, you know, she started saying all this stuff, and she, she, was, she was pretty deep into conspiracy theories, so she kind of equated me with being one of those weird people. And then I realized, okay, I got home, and I realized, you know, we actually need to get more. So I went back, and I was again like, you know, there was like there was a kid and his, you know, a dad with his kid right there, right in front of him. I was like, okay, I'm going to look weird if I go get three of those things. So I'm going to go around and come back, and, you know, finally no one's there, and I'm like, put it in real quick. Went through self-checkout so no one could see me. You don't have to get weird to be prepared, all right? So you don't have to be like one of those weirdos, you know, and and. Just, I would seriously, though, I would really pray about it. I would really pray about it. Lord, what do I need to do to be, to be materially prepared for, you know, we could, we could face, if, if, the, if the oil issue and them taking us off of oil and the U.S. dollar weakens and supply chain disruptions happen, there could be food shortages, all that. It's very uncertain. It would be much better to be safe than sorry. It would be much better to hope for the best and prepare for the worst than to a crisis hits and you're not ready for those things. I would highly recommend uh, praying about how you can get ready uh, materially with food and water, excess food and water for what could happen. Okay, You can do that in peace. You don't have to be panicked. Um, and so anyway, I would, I would highly recommend doing that, by main, but also maintaining your sanity. Uh, number 10, I want to close with this. Actually, I want to close. This is my last point. There's no safer place to be than God's will. <laughs> there is no safer place to be than God's will. I heard a story of a missionary named Jonathan, Jonathan Goforth. He lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he was a missionary to China, 
And he, the Lord really used him to bring a lot of people to the Lord. And he went on a missionary journey. They lived in China, but he, was, he really felt the Lord prompting them to go into the inner, uh, inner villages where it's really, really dangerous because of disease. He really felt the Lord prompting him to go into that area. And he, he told his wife, I think they, they had already had like, they had like seven kids. I'm not, I'm not going to get every fact straight, but they had like seven kids and I think several other kids have already died, and the wife was really apprehensive and said, you know, I don't want my children to go into there because they could die. And as, as Jonathan is getting on, I think he's getting on a train maybe to head out to the remote area, he says, I fear for my children. And basically because there's no safer place to be than in the will of God. And then he leaves to go off into this remote area, and then all of a sudden... Uh, two of her children get sick, one, one to the point of death, and the wife realizes, I have really missed God. I've been trying to hold on to my life the whole time, but my husband was right. I like that, my husband was right. But my husband was right. There's no safer place to be than in the will of God. And she repented. Her children got healed, and they, they went with her husband into the remote area, and her, her children never got sick. See, no matter what happens, there's no safer place to be in the will than in the will of God. We can't be like Lot's wife who left and looked back, and she turned into a pillar of salt. And right after that, the Lord said, remember Lot's wife. Think about that for a second. Remember Lot's wife. We can't look back to 2019. We can't look back to 2010, 2005. For dad, what, 19, what do you always say, 1950s, <laughs> 60s, whatever time it was. We can't look back to those things. Remember Lot's wife. We can't look back. If we try to preserve our life, we are going to lose it. We want to lose our life for the Lord's sake and then we will keep it to life eternal. There's no safer place to be than in God's will. Wherever God has told you to be and whatever God has told you to do, obey what he has said because that is your place of safety and protection, not in shrinking back in fear. And so as we bring this message to a close, I just want to say there is now the Lord graciously is offering us an on-ramp to readiness. There's no better time than now to begin making yourself ready. There is an on-ramp to readiness right now to say, Lord, I am going to make myself ready. You may not even know what that means. We're going to explain that very clearly in the months ahead. It's going to be very clear what that means. But don't, I just want to just urge us. I've seen it. I mean, when you turn 50, I can start using my age as like a qualifier now. When you turn 50 and you see the things I've seen, <laughs> when you turn 50, for real though, and I've seen many of these invitations come and go, and I've seen some respond and some not. Some who heard the same message and some respond differently than the others. My heart breaks to say, let us receive this invitation. Seize that invitation. It is the Lord's kindness and grace to you. Don't miss the hour of visitation and the hour of invitation the Lord is giving us right now. It is the Lord's kindness. It is the Lord's kindness to us to wake us up when we're asleep, isn't it? Even if we don't like the voice. You know, I just know even with Anna, when I, I started to try to wake her up, I would start waking her up and I just would learn from my dad to go in and start singing, this is the day the Lord has made and be real loud, turn the lights on. And man, she started throwing pillows at me and just yelling at me and all this. And I said, okay, I think I might need a different strategy. So now I tickle her feet and it helps her get up. All right, so if you need even a more gentle tone, dad's coming next. So, 
But he might sing to you, this is the day the Lord has made. Who knows what he might do? So, but seriously, though, it, it, we, we've got to wake up. Yeah. We've got to wake up and get ready. Amen. I'm going to have Dad come and come on up and share what he was uh, on his heart. Because he told me this yesterday, pretty similar to what I had gotten. So... I thought it was important for him to share as well. Amen. Amen. We've come up with a uh, a uniform uh, of the <laughs> of the overcomers. Yeah. <laughs> Brian called me this morning. He said, "Dad, hey, Dad, what are you wearing to church today?" And so I told him. He said, "Hey, let's start a uniform where uh, for those that are getting ready, uh, all wear together." So I think we're the only two so far that have this on, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know if this is good. This may be anticlimactic after what uh, Brian's message was. Really, really good uh, message, Brian. It was very, very powerful. Uh, but it does go along with it. It absolutely goes along with it. And I got this uh, uh, yesterday morning. Um, it's interesting. Donna told me today, she, uh, she said, look, look at the date. Uh, it's 3.20. Uh, you know, which is, all, you know, Jesus standing at the door, Revelation 3.20, Jesus standing at the door and knocking. So I think that is pretty appropriate uh, today. But anyway, the, 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 how the word came, I think, is important. But um, the, on Friday, uh, the Lord gave Donna this word from uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Let me just read it. Um, let me start with verse 3. Uh, for our, our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. And so she was talking about the idea of being approved. Uh, and we had heard this, this concept uh, with part of the Terry Bennett, one of the shallow meetings had given a, had talked about messengers and master builders that you have to be approved that you're there's a call uh, where you're called as a messenger, uh, and, but there's a, and there's a commissioning where you're actually sent out and there's a there's a difference you know in time in that time period and there's an approval process that takes place in the midst of that, where you have to go through testing and preparation and the, Lord, the Lord's dealings with you uh, in order to be able to be entrusted. So and it, and there's a purification that comes out of that, you know, just like it says in verse 3, uh, you know, the, you, to remove error in your teachings, to remove impurity in your heart and deceit in your motives and all that to, to bring a purification. So the approval process in that forerunner call, which we are all probably been through a lot of that our, ourselves, that, that approval process, uh, you know, is a, a time of testing and uh, pruning and purification so that uh, th there's a there's a, a truth and an error. I mean, a, a truth and a in a in a tr reality and, a, and an empowerment in the the call. So we had heard that before, but then Donna was looking through some of the notes on the bride, and she got this same, very same verse. She said, "That's what the preparation of the bride is between the betrothal and between the actual." Uh, you know, ultimate marriage ceremony, which will be when Christ comes back, there must be an approval process. We must be approved. We must, uh, there must be that preparation. And so you, she used that term and she was sharing that with me. And uh, I have, okay, uh, come on, come on up here, darling. We'll get to them. <laughs> when she said this, Yes, this is Friday. I had a whole bunch of other stuff on my mind. I said, oh, okay, sure, that's good. You know, I wouldn't pay a bit. I didn't pay any attention to her, but <laughs> now I do because I heard it. And he got it all wrong. He got that. He got, he got what he said right. But it started, I was reading Revelation 19. I've never seen this before. And it said that um, 
Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to God. The marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. But then it said it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, clean and bright. It was given to her because she had been approved unto God. And that just went all over me. It wasn't just her make, getting her garments ready, but she did it in a way that, got, that won God's approval, just like we have to be approved before we can go out. That anyway, that put a whole new thing on it. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. I, I, I missed that one when you shared it. <laughs> but that is good. So anyway, she got that on Friday, and then so yesterday, I just in my quiet time, I was just uh, just asking the Lord. I said, Lord, I wouldn't uh, I, give me a word because I, it was kind of a dead quiet time. And so then he, he almost immediately he began to speak this to me. And this is uh, this is where the challenge is going to be, uh, but I sense that what God was saying that the American church, the American church, must be approved in order to be the bride. Uh, that you know the church is betrothed, the true church in America is betrothed to Christ, and we want to become the eternal wife of the Lamb. But there must be an approval process. They must be approved in order for that to happen. Uh, and, you know, the, in, in the approval process, it's going to be God's going to come with, with, in issues. Now, this, I'm not talking necessarily to us in, who, in, in this room and, and those even watching on YouTube, but what I'm sensing the Lord saying is the global, I mean, the American church as a whole, it's going to have to be, go through an approval process. And, and, you know, our living in America means that we'll have to go through it to a measure at least as well, I believe. But through, you know, a measure of suffering and mistreatment, uh, opposition to the church that, that's coming uh, to America. Uh, and the betrothed bride must endure through this proving process that's coming to America. Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, if you think about the global church, uh, there's really no place in the world that has been blessed like America. Not even close. I mean, most of us have been you know, to di different parts of the world at least once or twice or whatever. You know, if you go and, the, you know, we've been, uh, we've been to Honduras, we've been to Fiji, we've been to India, and we've been to a number of places in Africa, and we've been to Europe and Australia. And, and some of those places are, are definitely, you know, prosperous places. But when you think of places like India and Africa, Fiji and Honduras, you know, most of the world, there's a, there's a real, life is very difficult, you know. But America, certainly not in our lifetime, post-World War II, has been, I mean, not totally. I mean, I understand that there's been a lot of issues, you know, civil rights issues and things like that. So, you know, not for, not totally. But as a whole, as a whole, there's been, you know, prosperity upon this nation. And so the, the bride has not had to be approved. But what the Lord, I, I, what I've sensed the Lord saying is, you know, a lot of what Brian was talking about in his message is coming to America. And we're going to go through some difficult, the country is going to go through some difficult times. Now, I'm like, I don't want it any more than, you know, Brian was talking about that in his message. I don't want it either. I hope that I'm wrong on this. But what I sense is, that America is going to go through some difficult times. I mean, just the go if they do go to a digital currency, which I kind of feel like they will eventually, it may not be, I don't think it's going to be in the next year or whatever, but it's going to be pretty in the relatively near future. 
Uh, I don't understand how, but that's going to change everything, and it'll give the government complete and total control over everything you do. They will have absolute uh, understand knowledge of how you spend your money. And, you know, just like Canada cut off the bank accounts of all the truckers that went to uh, Ontario, was it Ontario, Where, wherever the capital was. Ottawa, yeah, wherever they went. Anyway, so there's a, there is a process, there is a, um, some difficult times coming. Uh, and so the Lord, you know, what the Lord wants to do, really a lot of what Brian talked about in his message, but, you know, what I sense, several things, just press in, press deep into God, and God will be sufficient. His grace, we, and we talked about this, his grace will be sufficient. His power will be sufficient for us. But we have to, but we have to press in to God uh, you know, whatever that means. And then the second thing, Brian talked about this as well, community of the church family will be important. It's going to really be important for to build a, and we have that, we're blessed with that, but we, we, we uh, need to continue and the church needs to grow there. But at the same time, great miracles of biblical proportions will happen. So there's going to be a great, you know, it, it may be the worst of times, but it'll also be the best of times. Um, and, you know, we talked about this too, but we, we have to learn to praise in the midst of all this, celebrate, uh, and, and even, uh, I, the Lord, I felt like the Lord spoke this, and even dance unto him during some t our times of worship, uh, even in the midst of trials and testing. Um, and then this morning, the, well, during the worship in different times, uh, this, this came to me. Um, yeah, well, we were, I forgot who, how it came. I think Drew was singing about it. But the gold, talk about the gold refined by fire. Uh, gold, to be pure, has to be refined by fire. And the bride, to be pure, pure gold, has to be refined by fire. Um, uh, and, and, but here's, here's a, an important point. Uh, God will use us powerfully as messengers, master builders, forerunners, if we will say yes to the invitation to get ready. Because what's going to happen if this happens, you know, if, the, if our nation is really hit hard with issues, like just, just the economy, you know, would be sufficient, you know, not counting any kind of natural disasters or whatever. I don't know what's going to happen. But if it comes, people are going to be looking for answers. People are going to be people are going to be open to the gospel, open to you know explanation uh, in ways that they had never been before. And so, if we're equipped spiritually, and not just to be ready ourselves, but to ha to be able to be a voice, we we'll have a platform. Every one of us will have a platform. Now, you may not stand on a podium and preach to uh, tens or twenties or fifties or hundreds or whatever, but you'll have a platform at your work or wherever you, wherever you have access to. So, it, like Brian said, there's an invitation, and it's not to do more. You know, some, every time we have a mess service like this, there's always, I, I can't do any more. It's not to do any more. It's just to, just to learn, to learn. So you can be a voice. Um, you know, like I, I mean, Brian was saying, we're going to be talking about different things. I'm going to be talking about the bride, uh, you know, not every week, but it, uh, over the next while, uh, five different messages about the bride. Three about the bride in the book of Revelation, and then one about Matthew 22, the bride in Matthew 22, and then another one on the, the bride in Matthew 25. Just if you learn... What the, what's in those passages, you can be a voice. You can be a voice. Uh, and it'll be powerful. Uh, and, it, and it'll be good. So I think we are born for such a time as this. You know, I don't want uh, to have, I don't want America to go through hard times any more than the rest of you do. Um, 
I love the American lifestyle, you know, in terms of the comforts of it um, as much as everybody else. Um, but anyway, I said what I sense uh, the Lord is saying. So uh, that's my word. Yeah. I do one thing. Oh, I do one thing. I do want to do is I want to pray. You know, I do want to pray for okay, us. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Ahead. Yeah. Uh, one one little chorus that keeps coming to me. If it's okay, Brian, if we can. Well, let's sing. do that. We'll, we'll we'll stop online to do that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is uh, Judy or Shelley was. Uh, this is kind of an old one. So old chorus. Uh, no, no person singing it. But uh, oh, of course, what am I? What am I? <laughs> when I have, when I get these old courses, I have to call on Judy because she knows all these old courses, you know. All these, but you're not calling her old. No, 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 no. no absolutely no, not calling no. her old. No, yeah. no, no. It's what a mighty God we serve. You yeah. Know? What a mighty God we serve. Okay. Yeah. Don't right. sing. <laughs> Father, I do want to pray for us. Let's just let's just uh, pray for God's. Uh, uh, pre preparation and Lord, I know this has been a these teaching these messages uh, today have been very sobering and somber in a way. Uh, but we ask, Father, that you would just give us each individual uh, clarity on this. And so we, I want to pray this prayer from Colossians chapter one. And we ask you that, Lord, that you may fill us with the knowledge of your will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Yes. So that we may walk in that manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen us with all power according to your glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience as we may joyfully give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light as he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Amen. How do you like our shirts here? <laughs> <laughs> Come in the authority of the red shirt. <laughs> um, Lord, we do pray. I just want to invite you right now, whether you're here in person or online, to say yes to the Lord, to this on-ramp to readiness. And again, like what Dad said, it's not you doing more, but it's saying yes and then whatever the Lord, however the Lord leads you, but really taking it to heart and very serious. The Lord will show you how you do it, but just want to encourage you to say yes to the Lord. Father, I say yes to you. I say yes to you. Lord, I thank you for your gracious invitation to us, Lord. You're, you're very good and very kind. Lord, I pray that we would not trifle the prophetic word of the Lord. But Lord, we would take your word to heart with a divine seriousness, Lord. Father, to say yes to your invitation. Lord, I pray that we would not miss our hour of visitation. But Lord, we would be ready when you come, we would be ready. We would, we would uh, respond to this invitation of grace that is now being released, that a supernatural work of God might be done within us, not by our own strength or ability, but by the grace of God alone. And we say, yes, Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. We're going to end online right now, so thank you so much for joining in. All right, I have the thumbs up and I also have my wife going. What